Okay, thanks very much. So I should say that inequality is a topic of inequality is something that's actually new to me. I have not really sort of thought about it all that much. I've certainly not done any research on it until this project. There may be other people in this room who actually know more about inequality than I do. So why, why this? Well, there's actually a long literature sort of showing or asking whether inequality is bad for your health. And before I get into that literature, though, I want to show you something that actually surprised me. Again, I was new to the study of inequality before I started this project. There's been a lot of talk about inequality uh, in the popular press lately. And you would think that it was a really recent phenomenon, the rise in inequality. But in fact, it's not. So this is data for the US going all the way back to 1968 to 2011. And what you see is that the Gini, which is the typical measure, the most commonly used measure of inequality, uh, is something that ranges from 0 to 1. I'm, I don't know if everybody knows what the Gini is. I know it's an interdisciplinary crowd. I'm going to presume that everybody does. If you don't know what the Gini is, uh, I'm happy to explain it. It is essentially a measure that goes from 0 to 1, with 1 representing the most unequal and 0 representing perfect equality. And what you can see is that actually inequality has been increasing rather steadily since 1969. Okay? And in fact, although this starts in 69, you can see that it's kind of, it was kind of flat before that. It was 1970, was essentially the beginning of the big increase in inequality in the US. This here is not a true increase. This, um, this jump here is actually due to a change in the way they um, act income in the CPS. But so here, you know, actually income inequality has been increasing for some time in the US. I'm going to show you here for some countries. This is uh, the gene between 85 and 2008, before the financial crisis. It's a very fuzzy, but you can see here's Canada. So Canada has increased over this time period. It has increased in most OECD countries. Um, we have very little changes in France, Hungary, and Belgium, and actually some small declines in Turkey and Greece. Again, this is pre-financial crisis, so things are probably very different now. But rising inequality is something that is a, not just a US phenomenon. It seems to be a worldwide phenomenon. Why? I'll just spend a minute, because this paper is really not about why inequality has increased over this time, but for a little bit of a background, there's been a lot of work trying to understand why inequality has changed over this period. Um, for the most part, I think economists think, uh, at least in the US, a big part of the story has changed in the market for labor. So there's been skill bias technological change. Essentially, there's been a big increase in the return to education. So people with more education are earning relatively much more than people with less education. Um, there are other factors as well. One thing that's kind of interesting is most measures of the Gini are based on sort of gross income. And in fact, when you consider taxation and social transfers, for example, in the OECD, the Gini based on gross income is 0.42, but once you sort of take into account taxation and social transfers and look only at disposable income, it's considerably lower, which is not surprising. Um, but this is going to vary from, from country to country based on their tax. All right, so what are the consequences of increasing inequality? Well, it's bad <laughs> if there's sort of this declining marginal utility or return to income. Right? So we have all these people with a lot of income accumulating more, if their marginal utility of an additional dollar for the very rich is lower than the marginal utility of an additional dollar for the poor, then overall we're doing worse. Right? Um, it's all, it may also be bad because it ne can negatively affect growth. There's a lot of growth economists, particularly in my department at Brown, who have um, sort of looked at that. It's more theoretical, that literature, than anything. Uh, this is the consequence I'm really going to focus on here which is that it has the potential to reduce intergenerational mobility. And if that's something that we value, and I think most countries would say that they do value intergenerational mobility, inequality could be bad. So why would inequality reduce intergenerational mobility? Well, essentially, the relatively poor are going to invest less in the human capital of their children. And as a result, you're going to reduce intergenerational mobility, right? If income is largely a function of human capital, which, at least in the US and most industrial countries, is true, is largely true. Um, 
It's also, there's another sort of issue, there's always, there's this poor investment, this is poor private investment. When I say poor investments, I mean, uh, sorry, investments among the poor in their children. But you can also get with rising inequality, increasing segregation of the poor, right? And then you get sort of these negative peer effects that could also neg negatively affect intergenerational mobility. So this is, um, probably everybody here is familiar with this, this is from Miles Korak, kind of Canadian economist. And uh, this is a very famous picture, I would say, at this point. You've probably all seen it. Uh, what he's showing here for different countries is he has, on the x-axis, um, inequality, the Gini coefficient for different countries. And on the y-axis, he's got intergenerational earnings elasticity, okay? Which means, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with those terms, this is essentially the importance of one's parents' income in determining a child's future income. So high elasticity means not a very mobile society. And here is the Gini. Again, a higher Gini means more inequality. And so you see that in countries with high inequality, you also have low mobility, intergenerational mobility. So the US is here, the UK, France, Japan, the Canada's not here. Sorry about that, I should have, I looked, should have looked that up exactly. Okay, so here, this is just a cross-sectional picture. Um, you sort of see this strong relationship. However, there's more recent work by Raj Chetty, and anybody who's interested in inequality and, um, and also intergenerational mobility should really check out Raj Chetty's page. So he's an economist, he's at Harvard. He has this big project called um, the Equality of Opportunity Project, and he has access to really incredible data. He has IRS tax data from the US for the entire population. And he has it for a long period of time. And interestingly, he can also um, look at income of parents and children. And so he has all this data, he has aggregated it, and he has generated measures of income inequality and mobility for very small areas in the US for a long period of time. And all this data, you can just go to, go to the website and you can download it. It's really it's a tremendous resource for people who are interested in this topic. I urge you to take a look if you're interested. So what he finds is that areas with greater inequality are associated with lower intergenerational mobility for kids born between 1970 and 1990. But growing inequality over this period has not been accompanied by lower intergenerational mobility. So you see this strong relationship in the cross section, but when you look at changes over time, it is not the case that places that have become more unequal see reductions in intergenerational mobility, which is interesting. Right? Mm -hmm. So he does, so what Raj does is he essentially will take people, and so he'll take children, and he'll fix their location at where they were born, right? So he sort of, he doesn't know what to do about that either. It, it's an issue when you have so much mobility in a place like the US. But yes, right? so there's not much he can do about that. That's what he does. What is the research question here? I'm essentially going to be estimating what is the impact of rising inequality on human capital of the next generation. So newborn health, which is the measure, um, which is the outcome I'm, I'm interested in, uh, is it going to be both birth weight and an indicator for low birth weight, which is essentially a weight below 2,500 grams. This has been shown to be particularly predictive of future outcomes, and essentially by estimating whether there's a relationship between inequality and these measures of newborn health, not only are you getting an estimate of the impact of inequality on health, but you might be able to say something about intergenerational mobility, because this might be one of the mechanisms by which inequality might affect intergenerational mobility, and that is by negatively affecting the endowment of the next generation. Does that make sense? So the initial health of the next generation, I'm gonna, there's, I think it's probably on the next slide, is something that is highly predictive of future economic success, potentially. So what I'm gonna do when people look at, ah, I'm supposed to be repeating the question. Uh, so the question, where well, I'm supposed to be repeating the questions for the, for the recording. Um, well, I think in my answer I will basically be clear what, what the question was. So essentially what I'm looking at is typical in this literature is you just take an aggregate measure of inequality that is the same for everybody, and you just control for their income. And then you go a next step 
and you say, is it inequality per se, or is it something about your relative position, which is a function and part of inequality, of course, right? The more unequal that affects, that's going to affect your relative position. Okay. Um, so, which leads very nicely to the next point. So, essentially, the three measures of inequality that I'm going to be looking at is an aggregate measure of inequality, so that's going to be the same for everybody in an area. And then individual measures, which will vary based on the individual, and it'll be an individual measure of rank, and an individual measure of what's called relative deprivation, which I will define later. Okay. Um, so why newborn health? I already talked about this a little bit. It's a measure of initial human capital. It has really important long-term consequences. So Sandy Black, um, Paul Devereaux, and Kel Salganis, they have this fabulous data from Norway. And what they essentially do is they estimate the impact of birth weight on all kinds of really important future outcomes, things like IQ, things like educational attainment, things like employment and earnings. And they find that it's incredibly predictive of all those things. The way they deal with the fact that birth weight is largely a function of your parents' socioeconomic status, and therefore could be correlated with all kinds of other things, is they look within birth at twins. So they look at the same mom who gives birth to twins that are of discordant birth weight. Okay? And so they basically are just comparing, it's just a within twin comparison that generates these large effects. Okay? The other nice thing uh, about looking at newborn health is you there's sort of this strong influence of short term conditions on fetal health, right? So Doug Amond and uh, a number of epidemiologists have also sort of done a lot of work isolating the impact of conditions during the prenatal period on outcomes, right? And so the nice thing about looking at newborn health is, as opposed to, say, mortality, mortality is a function of an entire lifetime of insults. And newborn health is much easier to sort of isolate the economic conditions that are operative. Okay, with mortality, you really need to look at a person's entire lifetime and the economic conditions that are prevalent during the entire lifetime. When you focus on newborn health, it just makes it a lot easier. You can really just focus on that year prior to birth. The other reason why it's nice to look at newborn health, at least in the US, I'm sure that the same is true in Canada, is there actually is a lot of data on newborn health. So vital statistics data give you essentially at both aggregate and individual level data on birth outcomes at a local level for the entire population. So why would inequality be related to, okay, so there's two answers to that. Okay, so the question, let me read the question. Are essentially estimates that are based on twins generalizable to the population of singleton births? So they have also received that uh, question or criticism. And essentially there's, well there's, and so there's a couple ways to answer this. One is what they claim, and there is some evidence of this, that uh, the reason for the discordance has to do with, it's a function of nutritional intake, okay? That essentially where a twin is located and its proximity to the placenta is essentially the biggest predictor of how much weight it will gain, and that's random, and that's not terribly different from singletons. The other thing that I think is, well, and then the, uh, to get back to your question, there actually is a, tr a, a a considerable amount of discordance, you'd be surprised, between twins. Uh, so it's not, again, it's, it'll be smaller, but there is a significant amount of discordance between twins. And the third thing is they can actually do the same thing with, um, they haven't done this, but others have. I, mean, yeah, I have seen papers on this where they use a single, singleton siblings, and you get reasonably similar estimates based on the twin. So yeah, so that raises an interesting question, which is not part of this which is whether with twins, that might change your investment behavior as parents, and presumably it does. So why would inequality be related to health? There are two hypotheses. One is inequality is just bad for everybody, okay? And in fact, at dinner, we talked a little bit about this last night, sort of the stress of living in a society with considerable inequality can be bad for you, especially when that inequality, for example, in the US, is very easy to observe. So that's one hypothesis. Inequality is bad for us all, stresses us out, we don't like it, makes us feel bad. Second hypothesis, which is that inequality is bad, but only for those at the low end of the distribution, those who are relatively deprived. Okay? 
people at the top of the distribution are fine with rising inequality. Okay, so these are two different hypotheses. Um, why would inequality be bad for, every, for everyone? Uh, so, you know, sort of talked about, I talked about potentially just stressful, but there might be other reasons why it could be bad. Inequality might be bad for everybody if it has a negative impact on public investment. Right, so in areas that are more unequal, there may be fewer investments in, say, education or public health. Uh, in fact, there has been some work looking at that, and essentially there are some negative effects on investments in public education, but they're pretty small, and they're only coming from really small counties, really small areas in the U.S. Another reason why it could be bad, in addition to the high stress, is, for example, high crime. So in areas with greater inequality, you may have an increase in crime, and obviously that has effects on people throughout the income distribution, and you might argue it may have, any, have a bigger effect for people at the top end of the distribution. The second hypothesis, which is that inequality is bad for the worst off, this is essentially the relative income hypothesis, and there are a couple of mechanisms here. One is about social status and stress. So the, probably the most well-known examples of this are, is the work done by biologists. Um, Sapolsky comes to mind. So this is the work with the experiments with animals and with monkeys, essentially. So they will have monkeys, which are social animals. Uh, they will experimentally manipulate the status of a monkey. So they will take an alpha monkey from one group and move him to another group where he becomes a beta monkey. And uh, they look at changes in his health. And you see that it has very strong negative effects on the health of that monkey to move from being the alpha to not being the alpha. And they're very careful, so these experiments, they can make sure that it's not a function of the resources they get. So they make sure they get as much food as they would have otherwise had they been the alpha monkey, but now they're the beta monkey. And still conditional on food consumption, their health is much worse. Blood pressure goes up. They start pulling out their hair. They're very unhappy. <laughs> oh, do people start picking on you? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. It's the loss of the position. Oh, so you're saying, do you do better off when you become the alpha? I don't know because I think that's harder to experimentally <coughs> manipulate. Now I can't remember the paper that well. I think it's harder to make a monkey an alpha than it is to make a monkey a beta. You know? Exactly. So I think it's harder to manipulate that, but I don't, I'm speaking without remembering the paper that well. And I don't know if they were able to do the reverse. My guess is it's harder to do. Um, but that's an, yeah, right. That's a good question. Okay. Um, all right, so if it's this social status and stress, though, this assumes that people know how much inequality there is, right? So it's different with the monkeys because it's very clear who's the alpha. And the question is, is it really clear who's the alpha here? And essentially, now I found, I sort of looked at this. This is not my area. Uh, and actually, there's very, almost all of this work is, is done in different disciplines than my own. But my take on it is that people are very bad at no understanding and under how much wealth inequality there is, but they're pretty good at understanding income inequality. Okay, um, not perfect. And if anything, the studies that I've read, they actually perceive a little bit more inequality than there actually is. And so you just know you don't have that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that there is inequality and whether it's been increasing over time. Yeah, no, I think that's right. So what they underestimate is they, so these guys are. Right. Well, actually, so what you find is that people are perceiving a greater share at the bottom of the income distribution than actually are there. This is based in the US. I can't say that that would be true for Canada. Um, so in fact, they would think they're doing better off than they actually Think there's more. They think there's more peop poor people than there are, so they think they're doing better off than they actually.
but but it's a good question, and in fact, this 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 particular setup doesn't get at that. But it's always like an extraction of the Yeah. Again, but that's that's a my understanding is that's based. Uh, I I have to look at that study, but someone was telling me that that's based mostly on wealth, and not income, which are different measures. But I I would need to go look at that. Yeah. Right, so let me just rephrase that question uh, or statement, and it, which I think is true, which is there's sort of two different concepts here. Is one is where you think how unequal your society is, and the other is where you think you, you, you are. And those are two different uh, but related concepts. They could be different, right. Um, okay, so here's the, so, so there's social status and stress, we talk about that. And there's sort of the issue of the externalities of having wealthy neighbors. Um, that's going to depend in part on the level of segregation. So who your neighbors are depends on how segregated you are. So if you're super, super, super segregated, that you don't even you have no interactions with anybody wealthy. Right? Be less segregated and have some interactions, be totally unsegregated and have lots of interactions and lots of potential spillovers, okay? They could be positive or they could be negative, right? So on the positive end, if you imagine, for example, pollution. If you imagine pollution is a normal good and it's a public good, a normal good is if you have more income, you demand more of it. So the richer you are, the more likely you are to demand clean air and clean water. And if you have wealthy neighbors, and since Pollution is something that we all experience. There could essentially be positive spillovers of inequality. Okay. Um, there could be positive spillovers of if having wealthy neighbors brings in new public or private goods. Okay. And they could be negative if, for example, having wealthy neighbors means prices rise. Okay, so you ask anybody who lives in a neighborhood that's recently been gentrified, and they're not happy about having wealthy neighbors because essentially they have to move because the prices of, of, for housing have risen so much. Yes? So I think that's true. There is reason to think <coughs> that it, the effects might not necessarily be linear. They may be different, at different in different parts of the distribution. Um, obviously, for all of this, when you look at inequality, you need to do things like hold median income and share poor constant. Right, because all of these things are related, right, median income in particular. So <clears throat> all of this work really tries to distinguish inequality from other measures of, of income or wealth, average measures of income and wealth. And that's essentially what we'll be doing here as well. But no, that's a very that's the point well taken. So that was all the reasons why there might be a causal relationship between inequality and health, but it may be a non-causal relationship as well. So you, you see it in the data I'm going to show you in a couple of slides. Um, but there are sort of problems with just simply looking at inequality and measures of health in an area. So <clears throat> Angus Deaton is an economist at Princeton who has really written a lot about this. Anybody who's interested in this topic, I would highly suggest you take a look at some of his work. I think it's the best work. And he makes a very nice case that there's really strong omitted variable bias, okay? that there are lots of things that are different about areas with high inequality that are also correlated with worse health. And once you actually adequately control for those things, the relationship declines considerably. There's also this issue of the nonlinearity of income, which is the, you know what, I'm going to hold off on this for one minute. In a couple of slides, I'm going to show you the non what I mean by this. Okay? So I can just hold off on that for a minute. Um, okay, so what is the existing empirical evidence? There have been, you know, probably a thousand papers written on this topic. I have just pulled out one of the reviews. There are probably five review articles, each one reviewing 50 articles. I've just pulled out one. We reviewed 45 studies. For the most part, they find a positive relationship between the Gini and measures of health, which are typically mortality but they don't really deal at all with either this aggregation bias, this is nonlinearity I didn't explain, but I will in a minute, and this idea of omitted variables. So Deaton's work shows that 
one of the most important omitted variables is, and this is in the US, is the share of the population that is black. That is highly correlated with inequality, and not only do blacks in the US have worse health on average than whites, but even whites who live in areas with a lot of black residents also have worse health. Okay? What Deaton shows is if you simply control for that one variable, the relationship between the GE and health declines considerably in some cases with this one. Okay? So that's what I meant by omitted variables, and I'm going to come back to the aggregation bias in a bit. There's been less work on relative income and health. Uh, so people may know the white health studies. Uh, I think I'm not going to spend too much time here. I'll talk a minute about the white health studies. So these are very, in that's very interesting work, the white health studies. It was done by epidemiologists in the UK. They essentially find the Whitehall is the British civil service, and people who are high ranked in the British civil service are much healthier. They live longer. Um, they live longer. They're less likely to have cardiovascular disease. And so that was sort of a big, you know, important study, sort of suggesting that uh, your relative position matters. And Case and Chris Paxson got the data and actually looked and found that, not terribly unsurprisingly, those British civil servants who were higher class actually were healthier as children. Okay. Sort of suggesting that it, it isn't so much about relative status. But I will say that Chris Paxson and Doug Miller have done a, not, a number of other studies, and they, they do find some evidence that relative income does matter. Right? So for example, they're using data, mortality data in the US. Um, they find that an increase in the income of the white population is more predictive of poor black health than a similar decrease in black income. OK, so why are we, you know, given that there have been so many papers, why do we bother doing it? One is we're looking at a different outcome. So almost all of those other studies look at mortality. We're looking at birth rate and low birth rate. The nice thing about that is low birth rate really, you know, we're talking about sort of the bottom of the distribution. So we can potentially look at distributional impact, which is a nice thing. Data, there's tons of data on birth outcomes, so that's nice. We're also going to be using individual panel data. So we're using aggregate cross-sectional data, and then we're using individual panel data, basically from about 1980 to 2010. The nice thing about panel data is we can deal a little bit with sort of movement uh, and the fact that people move and where you move to. So this is a question you raised earlier. Maybe a function in part of your underlying health or inequality in your area. By focusing on panel data, we can actually fix people's residence where they were when they were between 14 and 21. Okay. Um, not unlike what Bracciacetti does. The other thing is we can get it, we can calculate a better measure of income. Right? So typically measures that look at, studies that look at this, they just have a single spot measure of income. And you know, a measure of income in one year, and that's, we know that is measured with a lot of error. So one nice thing about using panel data is you can actually get an average over a couple of years of mother's income. And you see that that is in fact more predictive than just a single measure of income. Okay. Which is sort of consistent with measurement error. Um, the measures of inequality and relative income that we use, we're going to use the Gini for inequality. And then for relative income, we're going to use two measures, rank, which is an ordinal measure, and relative deprivation, which I'll explain later. So um, identification. So this is the terminology that is typically used in economics. And you never know sort of to what extent other disciplines are familiar. Everybody knows what I mean when I say identification? Yes. OK, good. Um, so what we're going to do to essentially try to tease out whether the relationship between inequality and newborn health is causal, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use panel data. So we're going to just look at an area, fix that area, and look at changes in inequality over time in that area. So I'm not comparing two, I'm not comparing Montreal with Toronto. I'm comparing Montreal in 1970 with Montreal in 2010. And Toronto in 1970 with Toronto in 2010. And that way you sort of deal with lots of things that are very different between the two areas. Okay. And hold them fixed. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate an instrument for the, in for the income distribution of your neighbors. I'll, um, I'll explain that in a minute. I'll explain that right now. So the instrument for inequality. Essentially, 
I'll be brief about this. But the problem with using just sort of the actual measure of inequality, the Gini, is that it could be a function of the, it is largely a function of the underlying composition of the people living in the area. So there's just something very different about the people that live in areas with high inequality. Right? And um, if I don't control for all those things, then it's not clear what I'm actually estimating when I estimate a relationship between the Gini and the inequality. What essentially we're doing for to deal with that is we hold the distribution of income in a county or a state. Our area that we're looking at is, or we do it two ways, we do it with state and by county. I only look at large counties though, right? So we're not looking at small counties. Um, and what we do is we hold the distribution of income in that county fixed at its 1970 level. Then what we do is we apply national trends in income growth to the fixed shares our percentile, okay, to generate what we call either a predicted or a synthetic income distribution in that county for each future year, okay? So essentially, I hold your income distribution fixed at its 1970 level, and I just apply national trends in income growth for those different percentiles. So over time, income growth in the top percentiles has increased considerably, okay, nationally. And that's what I use to essentially predict what the Gini would be. Let me show you an example. Okay. When you do this with this synthetic or predicted Gini, it's no longer a function of change in the underlying composition of moms, which is what I want. Mm -hmm. OK. Oh, the top decile. Well, what I will tell you is, and I'm following Raj Chetty's advice on this, is we remove the top 1% of income, because they, that really affects the genie a lot. And we don't think that that matters all that much, right? So um, do I care if Warren Buffett moves in to my neighborhood? Not so much, right? Exactly, right? So he, maybe he was a bad example. He was a bad example. Fair enough. He was. Mark Zuckerberg, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Um, but I don't, you know, so you don't, the question is sort of whether people in the middle and the bottom of the income distribution really care about that millionaire. It's kind of hard to imagine that it matters a lot. And it moves the genie so much that you really don't want to be generating your estimates off of the, a millionaire moving in. Okay, but let me, so should I go over this example or are people just kind of fine with? It's really not coming from that. So what is the variation is coming from differences in the distribution across counties in 1970 and the fact that, so if you have two counties in 1970 and one had more at the top and the bottom, one was slightly more unequal, but in 1970 there wasn't that much dispersion in the income distribution. The top was not very far from the bottom. It was, there was, there was, yeah, but it, there's much more now. But that's what I want to do. I just want to exploit those changes over time. I want to exploit the fact that it's much more unequal now than it was in 1970. I'm using everybody, right? So I, yeah. That's what I'm going to do. So I haven't shown you any results, so let me hurry up. So this is just showing you how they are correlated, the genie and the synthetic genie. This is just showing you how it changes over time. You see that these numbers are considerably lower than what you see as the published genie because these take out the top 1%. So this is how the genie has changed over time in my sample, and you see there's considerable variation across time, over time, and across space in the genie. So let me hurry up there. So this is the average birth weight in the genie over time. So this is all years, and then um, 70 all the way through 2010. The only thing to take away from here is actually in 1970, there was really a very small relationship in the cross-section between the genie and birth weight, which kind of increases every decade. So you get a strong, in the cross section, you get a stronger relationship between the genie and birth weight over time. Um, share low birth weight, more or less, this, actually, you see less of that pattern if you look at share low birth weight. Um, what predicts increases in the genie over time? The share elderly, the share black, and median household income. Okay, those are probably the strongest predictors of changes in the genie over this time period. This is something that I mentioned before, and I'm worried it's limited to a minute, so there's time to get into this. But here's the thing. 
this is the relation between maternal income and birth weight. Okay? And what this is showing you is that the richer you get, the healthier your baby. But this relationship is very much nonlinear. This is based on NLSY data. Okay? So basically, it's strongly increasing up until about a little under $50,000, and then it just plateaus. These come down a little bit. This is probably just small numbers. There's small numbers of women with this much income in the sample. Why does this matter? I mean, you see the same thing for the share low birth weight. Okay? If you have these nonlinearities in income, you can find mechanically there's a relationship between inequality and birth weight. Right? So there's this nonlinearity will tell you that as more income goes to the top, you should see less of an impact of income on birth weight because of this nonlinearity. So mechanically, you get a relationship between increasing inequality and lower birth weight on average. Does that make sense? Okay. So this just means you really need to be careful about how you control for income. Um, quickly here, this is just put in cubics and in income. The only thing to know from this, I put in current income, and then this is this measure of average, an average of all past income. And what you see is, and I just end up putting in more and more controls, as you put in more in controls, the relationship between maternal income and birth weight declines considerably. It's no longer significantly statistically significantly different from zero. Um, but, um, well, that's really kind of the main thing. <laughs> uh, there's, the relationship is actually stronger when I look at low birth weight. Okay? The relationship between income and low birth weight matters a lot more. Right, which tells you something about sort of additional nonlinearities. Okay. Um, let me just go on and show you some numbers because we only have 15 minutes left. Here I just put in the Gini coefficient and no other controls. This is the, the level of the state. I'm going to show you the results at the level of the county. With each column, I just put in more and more controls. So here I put in state characteristics. Here I put in maternal characteristics. Here I put in... Um, State controls for state income. Here I put in state fixed effects, and here I instrument. No, this is all based on aggregate. I'll show you individual in a minute. Basically, the point to take away from here is it just requires a very parsimonious set of controls, and the relationship between inequality and average health that was so strong in the cross section essentially disappears. Hmm? This is the same thing at the level of the county. It's the same pattern. Um, same thing for low birth weight. The relationship is a little bit stronger, actually. But still, once you instrument, it completely goes away. Um, this is with individual level data. So that was aggregate mortalities. For this, I can actually control for the mother's own income. And I do it, obviously, in a nonlinear way. Here, you see, again, the relationship is a little bit stronger. You know, it holds on for a little bit longer. But eventually, once you include a county or a state fixed effect, you no longer get any any effect. Any, any relationship between inequality and birth weight. It's the same for birth weight. It's the same for low birth weight. Um, then I look at a couple of things. Even though you find some, nothing in the aggregate, it could be that there are certain things going on. It could be that inequality is bad and good. right? So it has some negative affect stress, but it might also bring in some of these public goods that we think are good. For example, NICUs, neonatal intensive care units. You might imagine if they're a normal good, if there's more income in a neighborhood, in an area, a hospital may be more likely to adopt a NICU, then everybody benefits from it. Okay? Another thing that might matter is segregation. As inequality increases, segregation may change. As there are, right? So, and when I mean segregation, I mean segregation of moms in different hospitals. So it could be that everybody went to the same hospital with increasing inequality. You have rich moms going to one hospital and poor moms going to the other. Um, essentially, uh, I find no effects on either NICU adoption or segregation of moms in different hospitals. Okay. All right. So, how do we interpret this? Um, could be that there's the Gini reflects you know, omitted variables or other changes in the underlying composition of the area that are really driving the relationship with health. Or it could be that the effect is heterogeneous, right? So, inequality matters differently for different people. And you just aren't measuring an effect in aggregate. So I do the assist with Henry ratio. Um, I thought I thought the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so rank. First, I'll start with rank. 
rank is really matters because this is you know sort of the animal studies are all based on changing monkeys' rank. Right? If I look at rank, okay, and again I'm going to do the same sort of thing, um, just kind of add more controls. All of this is their rank, but it's conditional on their absolute level of income. So I control for the mom's absolute level of rank, income, and I put in this measure of rank to where you are in the distribution in the county. And you see that it actually is uh, significantly sort of related to birth weight. And it is in a nonlinear way. I think somebody mentioned this already, I think somebody over here. In fact, rank matters a lot more for people at the bottom. So moving from 10 to 20 matters a lot more than moving from 70 to 80. What this says. Um, let me get back here. Uh, and so here I just actually interpreted you, for you. Going from a rank of 0 to 33 is associated with an increase of 106 grams. Going from 0 to 66 is only associated with an increase of 117. Right? So you're not getting much more uh, as you move up the distribution. Um, this is the same sort of thing where I just actually uh, split the sample into areas where there's a lot of dispersion in income, right? That's the high variance, and areas where there's little dispersion in income. The reason I do this is I try to get a sense of, is it just this ordinal measure, or is it your distance from your neighbors that also matters? So if you get a bigger effect in the high variance area, that would be consistent with your distance mattering too, right? This is only speculative, because nothing's really um, precise, but it sort of suggests that relative position may matter as well. So here's the measure of relative income that I use. It's actually, uh, it's called the measure of relative deprivation. And here's what it is. So um, for individual I, you essentially take the income of everybody who has earns more than you, subtract it from your own income, sum it up, okay? but then you divide by the total number of individuals in your neighborhood. So what this essentially tells you, it's two pieces. There's two pieces to this measure of relative deprivation. One is the distance between you and everybody above you, the average distance between you and everybody above you, but also the probability that you have people above you. Okay, That's why we, di why, why we divide by n, where n is everybody in the area. So it's not only the probability that people, there are people above you and how far above you they are, but the probability that you meet them. This measure, um, this measure of relative deprivation is very much negatively related to newborn health, and it doesn't change all that much as you add more controls. So this is OLS with the full set of controls and the fixed effect. Then I instrument for it, and then I do a fixed effect with an instrument, and essentially this relationship still holds. Again, all of this is conditional on a very flexible set of controls for your own income. So the instrument, again, comes from the same thing, which is the synthetic distribution of income. So I can measure your relative deprivation based on the actual income, and then instrument it for what it would be if I had this synthetic distribution of income, not the actual one. All right, so I repeat this all different kinds of ways. Increasing relative deprivation by one standard deviation essentially reduces birth weight by between 27 and 42 grams, depending on the specification. Right? So the estimates are pretty tight. It's not a huge range. And um, I'll do some other stuff with other data. The other things that I've looked at, and I think I need to really spend more time thinking about this, is um, selection into pregnancy and the extent to which inequality affects that and relative deprivation affects that. I have ignored that completely, right? And it could be that this really matters. I've only done it, I have done it for one group, which is teenagers, and I don't find effects there, but that, you know, this is in the US, teen pregnancy has been declining significantly over this period. So it, it, that's clearly, you know, I should have, before I did any analysis, I should have known that I wouldn't have found any for that. Um, but you could imagine there are other mar margins that really do matter. And that could actually be explaining a lot of this. So I need to spend more time on that. The other thing I've done, I've done this alternative measure of inequality, the 50-10 ratio. I was very surprised I didn't find anything there, so I'll skip up here. Okay, so this whole thing, yes, yes, relative, you know, inequality doesn't matter, but relative deprivation does. But I recently did this work with Janet Curry where we looked at disparities in health 
over the past, we just go back to 1990s, over the past 20 years, this is using vital statistics, the same data set that I used. That data set doesn't have income, but it has proxies for income. So we look at, we define mothers as either disadvantaged or advantaged. Disadvantaged mothers are African American, single, with less than a high school degree. We drop teenagers and we drop um, any mom over 40. Advantaged moms are white, married, and college educated. And this is the share of low birth weight births to these two groups. And what do you see here? If anything, despite rising inequality over this period, if anything, disparities are common. But we found this really remarkable in this period of incredibly rising inequality, in fact, if anything, disparities, at least on this measure, have declined. Probably. We tried to do our best to, to get rid of that, so this is understating that, because we drop any multiple births, and we drop moms over, I think I said 40, but it might actually be 35, I can't remember. But at any rate, we, don't, we have dropped the oldest mothers from this group, but I think you're right that this is probably coming from the ARC. If we didn't control for that, it'd probably be, be bigger. Hmm? So smoking is declining for everybody. The extent to which this is driving, actually, Fabian has some work on looking at education gradients in newborn health, or health and newborn health, or health more generally, when you look at smoking. Um, the extent to which this is, so whether or not smoking really sort of explains you know, <coughs> changes in behavior, that could be a um, problem with smoking data in the US is that for a couple of the big states like California, they only record smoking if there's a complication associated with the birth. So it's very hard to actually look at smoking in this because the states kind of report it differently. So I mean, the smoking rates in this group is like less than 3%, which is really low. And I don't remember what it is in this group. Yeah. But I mean, there is some work by others showing that relative deprivation does affect health behaviors. Uh, like smoking and eating and exercise. So that could be part of this. Yeah, I agree. Yes, okay, yes. So I did it, I did some additional. Yes, right. So another thing you can do is instead of looking at low birth weight, you can look at normal birth weight. So you cut out the low birth weights and you cut out the very high, right? So I've done some regressions with that and I also don't find anything. Um, but yes, you're right. You, you might expect that the margin is really on the high birth weight. But, I, but it actually sort of suggests that a better measure than birth weight would be like intrauterine growth retardation, something like that. Yeah. You know, you probably do, but I think the APGAR, I'll tell my APGAR story, one quick story. Um, they're very subjective, essentially, and they're measured with a lot of error. So my kid was born, he was really healthy, and he got a nine. And I asked my brother, who was a physician, I said, how come you didn't get a 10? He said, oh, the 10s, they just saved those for the doctors. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, you know. So the APGAR is, it, it's, you know, I think probably at the very top, I mean, I think there's probably no difference between eight and a 10, but maybe at the bottom, you, that, that might matter. So let me think about going back to the APGAR. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I really rushed through this talk. I apologize. There's a lot more of me talking than there was discussion. Sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah.